Hello, everybody. It is a real pleasure to host this next session, this next webinar with Chad Mason of the Cabana Group and my co-founder, our CIO, Stephen McClurg of Valkyrie. Um, just as a quick overview, this is our latest Bitcoin webinar, um, and we have, as mentioned, Chad Mason attending with us today. Um, just to kick us off with a quick agenda, so I'm going to give a quick overview right now. We're then going to lead it right into Chad and Stephen, who's going to have a bit of a fireside chat. Then hopefully I'm going to be able to ask them some of the questions from the audience. So please send them via the QA section of Zoom. I also have a couple that you pre-submitted. Um, and then after that, we will wrap everything up and please send any questions you have afterwards or any questions you have about you know, uh, the CE credit for today's portion. Um, just starting, you know, I'm Leah Wald. It's a real pleasure to have you guys all here again. I'm the CEO of Valkyrie. Valkyrie is a digital asset management firm. We have a series of cryptocurrency trusts and SMAs, ETFs, and a DeFi hedge fund. So jumping right in, Chad, it is a real pleasure to have you today. It's an honor. Your firm is brilliant. You know, I, 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 I can't even say all of it. Can you please tell us a bit about your background and about the Cabana Group? Again, thanks for joining today. Yeah, yeah, en enough about me. <laughs> um, I do, uh, we are uh, asset managers and we build um, active ETFs uh, that are listed publicly and we use those uh, to construct SMA models um, for advisors around the country. So that's the, the short story. I'm just excited to be here because maybe I can finally get some answers uh, <laughs> to your space and how, you know, maybe we can deal with this as, as asset allocators, you know, going forward. We got a lot of, uh, a lot of demand, if you will, from our advisor partners around the country. You know, they're getting you know hit up by their clients. How can they get exposure to this? And you know, as somebody who does scaled asset management, um, building, as I said, ETFs and and you know dealing with that space, um, this is really important. And so, thank you for having me on. I, before we started, I guess you can. Uh, Stephen and I were going back and forth on you know the way that that those of us who are really not experts in this field kind of look at it maybe an overly simplistic way. So I'm excited to just kind of get some of that answer. So thank you for having me. That's fantastic, Chad. And I'm hoping you ask him all the hardest questions. And we I'm can, going you know, to. I'm going to get to the bottom code. of this. I'm going to get to the bottom of this. <laughs> Good. Good. <laughs> Stephen deserves it. All right, Stephen, turning it to you. Can you tell everybody a bit about your background? Yeah, so um, I'm the, the CIO of Valkyrie, as Leah mentioned. Uh, I've uh, been involved in a couple of asset management uh, companies in the blockchain space over the last five years. Uh, prior to that, I was with Guggenheim Partners, where I uh, managed several uh, uh, portfolios, uh, particularly in fixed income, but also private equity uh, across uh, life insurance companies, sovereign wealth funds, pensions, uh, as well as mutual funds, ETFs, and USITs. So... Uh, and, and hedge funds, of course, too. Uh, so uh, most of uh, our portfolios were very esoteric. So getting into blockchain wasn't that much different than uh, some of the really uh, uh, off the wall fixed income type structures that I'm used to dealing with. Perfect. So let's kick it off, Chad. I'm going to toss you the mic. You're going to be the host for a moment here. Please ask Stephen all the hardest questions possible. And I'll jump back in later with questions. All right, so I want to I'm going to resume our conversation before the recording, but I'll, for the for your audience, I'll I'll start with the first question, which is, what is this stuff, man? Is it? I mean, is I got to think of Bitcoin differently than you know what blockchain versus Ethereum versus Coinbase? Because um, I mean, you know, for people like me out there who are not you know, certainly in any way, shape or form, a Bitcoin expert, but wanting to at least figure out, you know, what is this animal? Is it a donkey or is it a duck? You know, what, what is it? So that's my first question to you. Um, and, and tell them, you know, what your response was. And maybe that's just an overly simplistic first question, but I, I really want to know what is this stuff? It, it, it's a ducky goose. So uh, yeah, that's what I'm worried about. It's it's <laughs> I, that's right. I can't tell what it is. The first half looks like a duck, and the other half looks like a donkey. So <laughs> what yeah. is it? Well, maybe we we go back in time a little bit and and talk about what securities used to be. And you know, back probably you know what, you know I remember you used to have things called stock certificates, 
you had bond certificates, you had real estate deeds of trust, everything was in paper form. And, and if you remember, all that paper form over the years have become digitized, right? So it, it increased settlement times uh, from, you know, to, you know, a lot of cases, T plus one. Uh, mm -hmm. And even back when I was trading bonds, you know, you know, high yield was T plus seven, uh, investment grade was T plus three. Uh, and, and, and now everything's really, really migrating to T plus one because of the digitization of, of these paper certificates uh, that have been going on for the last 20 years. And think about blockchain as that next stage of digitization, going from a purely centralized uh, digital format with longer settlement times to a more automatic digital format. It's a lot of people call it Web3, right? Because it's that it's that next generation of what things can do in a digital format, uh, where uh, imagine being able to trade things T plus zero. And when I say T plus zero, not by the end of the day, but within minutes or even seconds. I mean that that's um, they need to know why how hugely important that is for people like me. So I just want to pause there for a second because there may be other guys on this call, or actually partners who use us for our models. This is so incredibly important, y'all. So when we when we reallocate or have in my business, we call it scene change, where we're noticing something that's going on in the macro business cycle or technically it's causing us to either add beta or reduce risk, you know, take beta off. We have to reallocate. And you're reallocating literally billions of dollars, right, at the same time across all of your models. Well, this T plus three versus T plus one is incredibly important because if it's T plus three and you're, you know, you've got flow coming in of, you know, 50 or hundred million a month. So you got money coming in every day. That money has to get parked until those transactions can clear. So this issue that you just said right there, I mean, that might be uh, the most exciting thing you said that I didn't even think of. Um, that's really, really relevant in my business. If you can compress that, um, we just had a call with our trust, with our uh, ETF trust. And we've gotten it from T plus three, which was what it was about two years ago, to really yeah. uh, T plus one. And if you could get it to zero, I mean, it's a big deal for us and our partners getting that money invested timely. You know, when they open an account, they get the money in um, and, and money out. So really important. Yeah, well, it's it's important for, for two reasons, right? And and well, there's support for a lot of reasons, but I'm, I'm going to go over two reasons that, that are that are extremely important. Uh, one of them is from a risk standpoint, and the other one is simply from a from a timing capital standpoint. From a risk standpoint, I want you to go back in time for a moment with me to a thing called the financial crisis. And imagine having repo trades on with companies like Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers that settled T plus three. Now, imagine if one of those companies went under during that settlement time, where would you be right now? And I asked that question because this happened to a lot of people. And, yeah, so I was going to um, say, that happened, right? I mean, <laughs> it happened. I believe that it happened. Really happened. Um, I don't know if, if, if you remember a thing called auction rate preferreds. And uh, the, the whole auction rate preferred market kind of blew up. I mean, it's, it, auction rate preferreds is a great way to do leverage on, on munis because it protects the, uh, the, the tax advantage that munis have. And the entire auction rate preferred market uh, uh, settles used to settle very slowly, and and Bear and Lehman were two of the biggest traders in auction rate preferreds, uh, and a lot of funds and money managers lost money during that period of time because they were in the middle of transactions with with those two banks and others too. By the way, I mean you also had Covia and, and some of the other ones that are out there. So so from a risk perspective. The, uh, the, the tighter you can get the spread between trade and settle, the less risk you have, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, now, let's also talk about another issue. And, and, and you, you manage ETFs. I, I manage ETFs. Um, if you ever manage, say, a futures-based ETF, you, you actually have to work through, in, anytime you manage futures, uh, you have to work through a special broker-dealer called an FCM. And FCMs are, are, are they're, they're dealing futures and they have a certain capital requirement that they have. And then you also have to have a capital requirement 
in order to even trade with the CME because everything's on margin with, with, with futures. Mm -hmm. So many FCMs post a large amount of capital that allow you in, a, in an ETF, when you get, when you get shares that are created, um, you have to, you have to use those created, the, the proceeds from those created shares to buy futures that day, right? And get yep. them posted that day. Kind of and like our custom basket creation redemption deal. That's, that's exactly we, right. Same deal. And, and most FCMs don't have the capital that allows them to post the futures to you that day. They, 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 want, they need to wait until that, that money gets delivered to them, which is T plus one, settles, and then they can deal you the futures. So you're always on a day, on a day lag. There's only a few that, that do that on the same day. And by the way, this is the reason why a lot of the Bitcoin futures ETFs haven't launched yet, because there's only a few FCMs and they only have a certain amount of capacity uh, and, 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 and that deal in Bitcoin that can even work with you, right? So that, that T plus one settlement date on cash is a problem. If you can get that to T plus zero, then it becomes a much more effective and efficient market. As, how, close as, as you is, how close are we to that? Uh, well, okay. that's what I mean, blockchain technology does, right? So we'll, we'll start with the Bitcoin blockchain, right? Which is the biggest, the most used. And the Bitcoin blockchain settles in 10 minutes. There's a reason for that. Um, the reason for that is security. That was, that was the amount of time that was chosen because uh, Bitcoin was created to be peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash that can be traded around the globe anywhere in 10 minutes. So, so the 10 minute mark was chosen so that people's funds are safe. And it gives all the people that are, um, that are running what, what we call Bitcoin miners, really all it is is a verification system that's decentralized uh, to, to make verification of transfers. And 10 minutes is enough time to where no hackers can go in and change anything without anybody else knowing, uh, which is one of the reasons what makes Bitcoin the most secure blockchain out there. Um, so, so, so from 10 minutes, that's, that's, that's not a, you know, that's pretty short from a financial. Yeah, that's, that, that, I mean, that's zero. That's T exactly. plus zero. Now, so the flip side of so, that is if you're buying coffee at Starbucks, uh, you know, you, you, you don't want to wait 10 minutes or sometimes 20 minutes. It depends on when, when, when the transaction happens. So, so, so there are some downsides to that too. Yeah. I didn't think of that. So, so you you don't have the immediate, whatever it is, 30 seconds that the goes out, looks at your bank, make sure you have the three bucks in there to, to clear your Starbucks purchase. Yeah, right? that's right. Which is why what Bitcoin has mainly been used for is large transactions, right? People right. buy cars, houses uh, in Bitcoin. Um, you know, the, the, you know, the Fed window is only open uh, to, uh, to, to make wire transfers during certain hours on certain days. What happens if you're a Saturday and you need to make a large transaction? By the way, Valkyrie, we've been in that position where sure. we want to buy something and we want to do it immediately and it's a Saturday. But what do you do? Well, luckily we hold Bitcoin on our balance sheet and we can make those transactions in Bitcoin with vendors that take it and they do. So uh, it's a great way to send wires. So can I, um, I want to back up and just because I want to finish the conversation we had again, I apologize to your audience but I was very interested in what we were talking about before. So I want to back up. So uh, just for a little um, color uh, background, if you will. So, you know, I, I'm really at this point in my life, Bitcoin agnostic, you know, I don't care one way or the other, except that I need a solution for my advisor partners who, who need me to try and figure out a way to, to help their clients get exposure. So I've got to do it in a way that fits within our models and that we can scale up. So with that background, that's why I asked this question. And I love what you said. So my, my, my question was, hey, man, it seems like without having to get into skew and, you know, uh, spot price versus the future spot price and all the, you know, liquidity and all the things that scare me uh, about scaling up Bitcoin, um, why can't you just put all of this technology, what I'm going to call you know, to me, it's all Bitcoin, right? It's either, and, and I loved your responses. So I want them to hear it because it's all Bitcoin, whether it's Ethereum, blockchain, it all just in my brain goes Bitcoin. Why couldn't all of this technology get sort of packaged up into one ETF that's sort of a sector? It's almost like a sector spider, 
Like, you know, we're all, all of us asset allocators and managers are using sector spiders. Why isn't there a sector spider of this technology, uh, including Bitcoin? And you said, well, that's the dumbest damn thing I've ever heard of. So go ahead and tell us why. I thought that's it was exactly genius. how I said it. No, <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was genius <laughs> in your response. Um, well, and by the way, there are people out there that are that, that are trying to create an index of, of all the different cryptocurrencies out there and crypto assets out there. And I, and I, and I think it's a terrible idea, right? It's, it, it's sort of like, and, you know, and, and, and my response to you earlier was it's sort of like, all right, well, 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 some financial advisors love it when you have an ETF of the S&P because you don't have to make a whole lot of decisions in equities or uh, an ETF of the Barclays Ag because it kind of takes all the, the different sectors of fixed income and puts them together. Well, blockchain's not like that, right? If, if you were to make a basket of all the, diff, you know, of all the top 20 crypto assets that are out there, it would be the equivalent of creating an ETF that has some uni bonds, uh, uh, some treasuries, uh, a bunch of equities, mostly tech equities, uh, some real estate, maybe some art, you know, all packaged into one to ETF. And some people might say, well, that actually makes it easy for me as a, as a, as a retail investor because I could just buy a, you know, a basket of everything and just, and just go away. Well, then what do you do as a financial advisor? You know, you yeah. buy a single <laughs> singular ETF and, and yeah. to be done with it, you're, you're no longer an asset allocator. You're no longer making decisions for your clients. They're customizable. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and it's probably a really bad basket to begin with, right? That, uh, that, that somebody's just, just, just slapping together. Well, well, that's what would happen if you put all crypto assets in one basket, right? Because so, it's the technology, so it, it's all running on a technology, but the crypto assets are all very different. There's some that See, are that, similar. That's the important thing. That's the takeaway for me, which which was the most important thing to go. Well, it is because I said so, man. Is it is Bitcoin? Um, is it a duck or a donkey? Is it a currency? And you were like, yeah, Bitcoin is a straight up currency. Is that right? That's right. Okay, so Bitcoin is a currency, um, and we we you know are very top down asset allocators. We use the U.S. dollar, you know, reserve currency of the world as an asset class. We believe that yeah. is actually an asset class. So you would you would um, compare Bitcoin uh, to the U.S. dollar in those terms as an asset class. Is that the correlation? Does it that, correlate with the U.S. dollar in what way? Well, the thing is that is the asset class that it's in. It's it's it's. I would put I would put it in the same asset class as the U.S. dollar, as global currencies, as even gold as a as a as a currency okay. reserve. Yep. all together in one basket. The difference is it's not correlated to any of them. The reason why it's not correlated is because it has a fixed supply, right? The reason why we have inflation at the levels that we have right now and that we've had inflation that's mm -hmm. run wild since the 1970s is because we just keep printing more dollars, right? And the more dollars we print, the less value those other dollars are worth. And it's one of the reasons why a lot of people in the past have allocated uh, to things like the Swiss franc or the Singapore dollar. Uh, there's some currencies that have a limit on how much they actually mm. print, uh, which makes them more valuable over time and, and less likely to inflate uh, like the dollar's doing right now. Uh, and then there's other currencies that are, that are highly inflationary, even hyperinflationary, like the Zimbabwe dollar, right? Um, and so, so what, what Bitcoin really is, is that, that currency reserve asset that's within the asset class, but is not inflationary because of its fixed supply. And so is, that's why Bitcoin gold? has been going up as the dollar has been going down. Right. So, so, um, it, so is it gold? So gold, you know, can act as a commodity, um, you know, it's used in industry, et cetera, et cetera, jewelry. Um, and it's also, um, in a sense, a, a reserve currency. So is it like gold? It, it would probably be, the, the, it does have some similarities to gold as a, as a, as a store of value. Uh, but Bitcoin is a lot more useful than gold. So it's more like a currency than it is than a, than a, than a commodity store of value. Because it is actually useful. You can actually transact in it. Uh, mm -hmm. It's easy to transact in it. It's secure. You can move you can move it around the world among different people very quickly, whereas you can't take gold bars 
if, if I were to pay you in gold, I have to figure out how to get you my gold bar, right? Yeah. Uh, or I might have a derivative of that gold bar. Bitcoin is Bitcoin. I can send you Bitcoin right now. By the way, there's even, there's, even though Bitcoin is extremely secure, when I was talking about it takes 10 minutes to transact, um, there are applications that allow you to, to move it rapidly back and forth. Uh, I could send you Bitcoin right now and you get it in two seconds. What, what, so let's, I don't want to forget my other point because I want to get to <laughs> that's meaningful to me and how I'm going to adopt this. But to your point there, so how would you do that really? So, you know, I'm 50 and I, you know, I'm old and I don't have a wallet, a Bitcoin wallet. How are you going to pay me in Bitcoin? Well, first of all, we'd have to get you a Bitcoin wallet. So when, when, when we're done with this, I'm going to, I'm going to send you a couple of uh, things to download. I'm going to get you a Bitcoin wallet and I'll, and I'll send you some Bitcoin. That way so you, is can, that like you can tell your up kids. Account, cool. is, is a wallet an account? Is that the same thing as an account at a bank or at TD or I'm opening up an account as a wallet? Yeah, it's very, it's very similar to that. Yeah. It's, 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 it's just, it's, it's your bank account. We just, we call them digital wallets. Okay. Okay. So uh, I want to move on. So you think, and like right now, just for your audience, we're, we're working with Valkyrie to sort of do some correlation coefficient, you know, some statistical modeling of, of how Bitcoin, and we focused on Bitcoin prices because we've had that the longest. I think we got back to 2012. Is that right? Is that we've got historical price data on Bitcoin? Yep. Okay. Yep. So trying to figure out where, you know, where to put this duck or this donkey in relationship to other asset classes, which is how we build portfolios and how we remove and add beta. So, so Bitcoin's a currency. Keep, keep going in our conversation because you were like, okay, well, blockchain is a, a technology that allows you to, you know, to communicate transactions, I think is about right. Is that fair? Absolutely. And, okay. and, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll point this out too. I mean, here's some of the other uses that are, that are, right now being implemented for blockchain. Um, let's talk about ETFs. I mean, that's, that's, that's an easy one, right? Uh, you have an ETF, which is, a, which is a basket of securities that you typically trade uh, on the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ or, or, or some other type of intermediary. And you use transfer agents to move that, that ETF back and forth between, between people. And you usually have other intermediaries that are working with those transfer agents. And you've, you've, you've got a lot of different people and that are, that, are, that are working on these transfers and these selling. And that means you've got a lot of hands in your pocket, right? Well, you can essentially take that ETF and instead of trade it through, a, through an exchange, you can create a way to actually put that where it trades on the blockchain, where the blockchain is the transfer agent. So think about that for a moment. Think about how much fees would go down without a bunch of intermediaries, right? And, mm -hmm. and think about how fast it can settle. You can do that with bonds. You can do that with equities. You can do that with ETFs. You can do that with uh, closed-in closed in funds. Already? Um, I mean, is that already out there? I mean, are people yeah, doing it? Yeah, it's already out there. It's, it's already happening. Um, and then it's, it's, it's slow now, but it's, it's, we're, we're going to see this really, really soon. What's even more important is I remember back about 10 years ago, and this was after the financial crisis when we had helicopter money coming at us, we were trying to figure out ways to create um, products that were good hedges against inflation, right? And of course, those products would be very valuable right now. Um, but, but think about the things that are most, uh, that are that the best hedges against inflation, right? I mean, equities typically do correlate well to inflation when there's an yeah. inflationary environment, they go up. But things like art, wine, classic cars, yeah. any kind of collectibles, any kind of hard assets, Real they go up in value. Right? Hard assets, yeah, dirt, man. Exactly, so, so, farmland. Yeah, Houses. so I mean, that's, that's what I was thinking, you know, uh, when we were modeling it and looking at it, you know, that was my initial gut was, it's gonna be, you know, it, it's gonna be inversely correlated. Um, you know, with the dollar in the sense, it, just because of that, it's got a limited finite supply. It's a bit of a hard asset, right? Right. Um, as far as, as far as uh, the Bitcoin itself goes, but can you tell me, so to your point about the technology side of it, and I, I'm very much a compartmentalized sort of um, kind of keep things in, in line here. <laughs> what, what, what stock 
would you compare that technology to? Is it Hewlett Packard and IBM in the 70s? Is it Apple in the early 2000s? What is, where does that technology fall within a company that everybody on this call kind of understands? Where is it? Yeah, well, and if so, is it, am I thinking of it correctly? It's an equity in that sense. Is it, is it the companies that are involved in that are, are technology companies, early yeah. stage tech companies? I mean, that's, I mean, that's where the potential certainly lies, right? I mean, think about it like Apple, you know, as the iPhone's coming out or Hewlett Packard in the 70s, right? Uh, Amazon, uh, you know, these were all companies that created new technologies that people are using. Um, but think about, think about this as more so harnessing the power of a new technology like the internet, which you couldn't just go buy the internet, right? You had to invest in companies that were utilizing the internet. No, but you well, can buy internet stocks. You can buy an ETF of internet stocks. And that's what I mean. Something you, like a basket kind of deal. Going back to my first thing you said I was crazy about. Yeah, well, but, but what this was, was companies that were utilizing the internet, right? You know, yeah. baskets of companies that were utilizing the internet. Yeah, you could go buy companies that are utilizing blockchain. And by the way, you know, we're we're uh, getting ready to launch an ETF or several ETFs that do that. But um, what you can do is actually buy into the network itself. That wasn't something you could do with the internet, okay. with internet stocks. When you buy Bitcoin, when you buy physical Bitcoin or spot, spot Bitcoin, you're actually buying into the network that's growing, right? You're not just buying a, 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 a token, a digital it's, token that represents then, a currency. You're, well, then you're, it's more you're, than a currency. That's what I'm saying. Is it a, is exactly, it a yeah. duck or a donkey? Now you're saying it's something else. It's both. What is it? It's both. It's as, as the network grows, the value of that token grows, right? So, so as, as more and more people get involved in Bitcoin, that's why Bitcoin price has been doing this. It's because as more people buy into the network, as they own Bitcoin, it becomes more valuable because it's being more it's, it's being more used. Think about the dollar after Bretton Woods, right? Prior to that, the you know the, the British pound and, and even a little bit before that, uh, Deutschmarks were were currencies that people used as reserve currencies around the world, even even people that are outside of uh, the UK and, and, and Germany. And then when we had hyperinflation in Germany, people didn't want Deutschmarks anymore, and they sold them off. And, and, then, and then we had the stories of people going around with, with wheelbarrows full of Deutschmarks trying to buy, um, you know, trying to buy bread. And then, and then when, when the UK spent all of their money and started kind of potentially going into a hyperinflation mode, just protecting themselves in war and then going to war and paying soldiers, you know, it, it, it got very expensive. And that's when the US stepped in at Bretton Woods and said, okay, look, you know, we're going to hold everybody's gold for you. The dollar is now the reserve currency of the world. And as the dollar has more and more and more adoption, it becomes more and more valuable because everybody's using it, everybody's transacting in it, right? And it becomes the, 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 the global currency. And then when we tied it to the petrodollar, it became even more valuable. Well, now it's sort of hit its peak and we're starting, now we're taking advantage of the fact that it's the, that it's the global reserve currency. We're printing more of it to fund all the things that we wanna do. And now it's starting to go down and inflation is getting out of control. Think about Bitcoin as a network of money and then more and more people buy into it and transact in it, the network and that money becomes more and more valuable. All right. So, so we talked about Bitcoin. So give me, give me um, some other um, segments of this industry that I need to be thinking about separately that I could either buy or uh, integrate into my own, you know, sort of um, synthetic ETF that I might create. So what's another one? So it's blockchain, you can buy blockchain, right? BO, is it BOK? What's the ticker? Well, there is no, there is no ticker for, 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 for blockchain. I mean, you know, there's, there, I think there's one out there that companies that utilize blockchain technologies, um, but the other tokens, you know, if you want to think about cryptocurrencies, uh, the next biggest group right now is what's called protocols. And Protocols, think about them like one of these, right? You know, everybody's got an iPhone or, or something similar in their pocket, whereas we all used to have Blackberries and flip phones. Um, protocol, protocol blockchains are 
blockchains that people are building applications on, just like you build applications on an iPhone. And then people use those applications. Um, they have a token related to them or a cryptocurrency related to that blockchain because every time that you, there's a, um, a transfer or something that happens in, that, in, in, in all those various applications, you pay for them just like you pay for your network, right? You have your monthly bill uh, yeah. with, with uh, AT&T or Verizon or whoever you have that gives you unlimited data. Most countries, you don't have unlimited data. You have to pay for the amount of data that you use. So it's kind of hard for us to get into that mindset, but get into that mindset for a moment. Every time you use data, you pay for it. Those crypto assets like Ethereum, Polkadot, uh, Algorand, Zilliqa, um, Tron, those are, those are crypto assets that are used to pay for the data for all the applications that are building, building on top of it. So stop right there, just because I'm sorry, because these guys on your call may already know this. So Ethereum is not a coin. It's not a currency. It's, it's t- tell me one more time. What, what is Ethereum? It's a currency for its own network. It's your data charge. Think about it like that. Okay. And you, and you might say, well, why don't you just use US dollars? Well, Ethereum is a global network, right? Who's to say that, no, we're going to use dollars for this. And, and, and by the way, it came out of Canada. Are you going to use well, How do you redeem dollars? it? How, how do you use it? Okay, so, okay, that's, it's a currency that's used for this to make transactions in this digital space. But to me, you pay for something, you're, you're transferring, you know, one source of value for another. So you're getting paid in Ethereum for this, for your information, as you described it, like AT&T. Well, what do you do with it? The person who receives the Ethereum payment, what do they, they just have to use it in the same space? They can't take it to Starbucks like the Bitcoin, right? Well, the thing is, you know, yeah, they, they, they use it in the same space, but think about it like this. There's like a, there's exchanges out there where people can buy and sell them. And it's sort of like you're, you're betting on the value over here and then you're actually spending it over here on, on, on that blockchain. So, so for instance, I can speculate on the cost of Ethereum. I can go to Coinbase or Gemini and just trade Ethereum all day long and speculate on what the what, what the price is going to but be. But it's derivative. It's, it's derivative. It's it's a, it's not a it's a derivative, like an yeah, option. That's a good way to think about it. That's a good way to think okay. about it. Um, okay. But but it is the currency that you have to use in their ecosystem. Think about it like this: uh, Have you ever played Fortnite, or do you know what? Or your kids play Fortnite? You know what that is? I've heard of it. Yeah, I've never played it. So when you are playing Fortnite, you have a thing called V-Bucks and you have to buy these V-Bucks. And every time you buy a a new skin or a gun or something like that, you have to spend V-Bucks on it. Well, think about the Ethereum network like Fortnite and then ETH, the currency, is V-Bucks. You use it and you spend it and you receive it within that game or that network. But you can also take it outside of it and trade it with people to speculate on what the price is going to be later. So it's like a, it's think about it like, um, no, think I, about I get it that. like the Chicago Merc, right? <laughs> you've got, you've got, you've got, you've got, you've got real commodities over here that people are using, yeah, yeah. but then they're speculating it out with it yeah, over here. Yeah, right. So, all right. So, so there's that segment. You've explained to me the Ethereum, how it's different from Bitcoin. Um, any other analogies I can make to things that I'll understand, like a normal, a regular equity or a bond or a stock that, that I'm familiar with? Yeah. So, so, so those are like probably the two biggest categories. And then, and then here's something else you can do, right? I'm going to, I'm so, so you can, all of these, a lot of these blockchains have, and when I talk about the protocol blockchains, we just talked about Mm -hmm. have real, uh, real applications, right? So for instance, there's a group of, of, of cattle ranchers in Wyoming that got together and decided that, hey, you know, we, we produce really high quality beef mm-hmm. and it's grass fed, grass finished, and we want to sell it for a premium and want people to know that this is, this is good beef and we don't want to get mixed in with, you know, USDA choice, right? So they built a so they took a blockchain and used it to track that cow and everything that that cow ate 
all the way through production, all the way to the package or the steak that you're eating at home or in a restaurant. And you can track the whole progress of everything that happened on a blockchain that's secure. Nobody can go in and change it. And you know that this was that cow that came from this ranch that was right. grass-fed, grass-finished. Walmart, for instance, uh, does this with organic produce, right? To make sure that that produce is getting from the, from the source all the way to your kitchen. And you know exactly where it came from and exactly where it went, which, which facilities it went through. And by the way, one of the reasons why that's really valuable is let's say there's an Ebola outbreak right? And it happened at this one factory, this one place, you can yeah, track, track it on the it blockchain and see exactly where it is and pull it from and pull it and pull it from. All right. So, so if that's going on, and you know, I'm in North today, Minnesota, so I, you know, I'm a Walmart fan. Um, so what company, what, what, what ETF can we buy that benefits from that beyond what you just told me, or do you just buy Bitcoin because it's synergized into this whole process? Or do you buy, you know, the one that reflects Ethereum? What do you, what do you buy? Bitcoin. Bitcoin. It's as simple as that. You yeah. think Bitcoin is just an aggregation of all of the uh, benefits that you've described in this technology in one spot. Yeah. Right. Not, not only is it a currency that, that, that I can. OK, here's a good example. This this painting right here behind me, I bought it with Bitcoin. There's a local artist here in Nashville. And and and, and I have this rule now. It's like, you know, this is this is the currency I use. If I'm buying something that's more than, you know, a few bucks, I buy it in Bitcoin, right? So not only is it that currency that there, but it also is the major currency for the entire blockchain world, right? So you don't, do you, so let's just cut through it. So you, who are a guru at this, you only buy Bitcoin. You don't buy any of the other, the other segments of this industry. You just focus. No, no. Oh, on I, oh, I do. I, I buy, I buy all kinds of stuff. What? Um, so, you know, here's a good example, Algorand, okay? Algorand is a blockchain that works really well for security transactions. Uh, it's essentially, they, they have like a, a, a whitelist capability within their protocol to enable KYC AML that um, works really well in, in major jurisdictions like the US, the UK, and the EU. So that's where a lot of security tokens are built on, you know, securities, you know, equities, real estate, um, um, uh, fixed income, you can, you can build it and transact it on that Algorand blockchain. So, you know, so if, if I believe in the future of that market, I might buy Algorand. Um, and that's a stock? NFT. Is that an equity? Is that an equity? Stock no, no, Algorand? it's, it's, it's a cryptocurrency. It's another, it's another, it's another crypto asset. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, another example is NFTs. Uh, NFTs has essentially become digital art. But it's not just digital art. It's also uh, video games. And uh, there's, there's all kinds of things in that, in that world. And we could do a whole segment on that. But if you believe in the future of, of NFTs, then you might want to buy some of the major blockchains that hold them. And that would be you know, Ethereum, uh, Tron, Zillica, right, are, are really good examples. If you believe that video games are going to be built on blockchains in the future, which I do, you might want to build, buy something like Solano or Polkadot. And again, um, so, those are currencies. Those are similar to Bitcoin. They're, they're, that, that's exactly right. But currencies for their own little ecosystem. Yeah, and that and that, so you're, see, that's very helpful to me. I don't think that's ever dawned on me until we've had this conversation. Yeah. And, and yeah. Leah, man, I'm sorry. I can go on and I don't want to <laughs> uh, take up all your, your client, your people's time. So I can stop. But I want to ask one more question and then I'll shut up. So... I have to deploy, you know, in any position, I mean, any position we take has to be able uh, to handle, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars at once, okay? So I can't go, but I don't have the luxury of going and buying $10,000 worth of whatever. You know, if it's, if I'm using it in our, you know, solutions, it's going to have to be able to handle the scale of two or three or 500 million a pop. What do you do in that? Or is, is this space even ready for that yet? Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's there's billion dollar plus transactions on on Bitcoin. I mean, I, I don't know if you saw where Elon Musk said, "Oh yeah, I just tested." No, I mean, one and a half yeah, billion. I know dollars. Elon Musk, but I represent like normal people in the world. 
who mm -hmm. are trusting me with their, you know, they're qualified and, and you know, and their life savings. I'm not Elon Musk. Right. So um, I can't, you know, I can't treat it like a hedge fund. Where does it, how do I handle that? Is it ready for that? Yeah, it is. I mean, for instance, you know, we've, we've created a couple of different uh, private trusts where people can invest in. So, so we have one that all it does is hold Bitcoin. That's it. We, we, you send it to us, we buy the Bitcoin for you, we hold it. It's pretty cheap uh, for, for us to do it. We've come up with a way to make it really, really, really simple monthly reporting the whole thing, right? But is it, can a custodian, can a custodian right hold it? Can, can Fidelity or Schwab or guys that are TD, can they hold the, those positions? Um, some of those can't yet, but, but we, we have selected a custodian on the back end for us. Um, we, you know, that custodian has insurance on those accounts. So we're, we're able to, 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 to do it pretty well. Um, and then we created another trust that holds our top ideas in protocols, right? You know, when I was talking about the whole segment of protocols, like Algorand and Tron and uh, Zillica and Polkadot, we, what, we, what we did is, is say, okay, our, what we think the top five to 10 protocols of the future are going to be, we're going to allocate to those all within this vehicle. And uh, it's not a hedge fund. It's just, you know, really simple, really simple vehicle that, that we do that in. Uh, where it's not in the index. It's uh, no, very specific to protocols. How far away um, are we from um, a straight up ETF that's based on spot, not, not the futures? I don't think it's going to happen for two more years. That far. Okay. Yeah. So how close in... Um, I think it is important. It was important to me when I was looking at your stuff. You know, you got you guys are going out one month on the on the futures contract. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, we're doing yeah, one. So month you're you're month. as close to to real time as there as there is in a product. Is that right? Exactly. How, how far? What's your dispersion from spot? I mean, do you have an average of that? You know. You know, it's too much. It it we haven't had too much. We haven't had enough time pass. But we did do an analysis where we'd be about five to eight percent off. Okay. Uh, any, any, when we, right when we is launched. It, is, is it in both directions or is it is it weighted it's in both towards, directions? In yeah, both that's, directions. that's right. That's right. Depends on if Bitcoin's going up or down. Um, so well, what's think, your what's y'all's volume? Your daily volume at this point? Well, let me look real quick. Um, today, for instance, we've done seven million dollars in volume. You know, seven million notional in volume already. So what's that in shares? Can you tell? Uh, it is uh, 378,000 shares. Okay. That's pretty, is that an average kind of half a day? No, situation? that's real time just now. That's, that's what I mean, is that, is that what I'm saying? Is that, is that consistent with what you're seeing typically? Yeah. I mean, look, some days, are, some days are higher, some days are lower. It just depends on what's going on in the market. But, uh, but yeah, that's, that's pretty consistent. I mean, it's it's quite a bit for a new ETF. It's, it's no, yeah, no doubt. Man. Yeah, that's legit, no doubt. Yeah, I mean, we were quite shocked. You know, we 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 launched our ETF on a Friday, three days after a major competitor launched the first one. We were we were number two, and we later found out from the guys at Bloomberg that we had the 14th biggest ETF launch of all time. Mm -hmm. Hey man, I'm gonna, the reason I'm on this call is is obviously I'm a very I, I want to solve for you know what what I need to solve for which is you know building products for my advisor partner. So um, the the demand is huge. It's out there and it's it's growing. Um, I just I just feel like for people like me who are very conservative, risk based, um, all of that stuff, you, you almost have to have an institutional adoption. We've got to be able. It's got to be big enough and bulky enough that we can know, is this a duck or is this a donkey and where to put it, um, you know, to feel safe. Because, I, you know, I can't put, um, you know, we're not Elon Musk, right? right. So if it does drop from 60 to 47, um, you know, I got some splaining to do, <laughs> so yeah, to speak, exactly. right? And if I can't get out, you know, and the spreads are too much, you know, all that stuff is important. But yeah. anyway, well, I'll as I said, I mean, you know, we're working with, 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 with your team on, you know, our you know, yeah, I mean, I'm really... all that data on the back end, but, but there is one other thing I'm going to say, and, and, and this is really important, right? Um, I, I think we're in a, in a, in a different paradigm right now. Right. And, 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 and by the way, you're talking to a guy who, you know, I used to manage, manage money for life insurance companies. 
So if you think about what a typical life insurance company is, it's a way different mix than, than some of your clients. You, you might be in a 60-40 or a 70-30 model. Uh, life, life was like, you know, 90-10. Yeah. That's like 90% fixed income, 10% private equity to get a little bit of juice. So imagine, imagine life insurance companies right now that are even more conservative than what you have to deal with. And you've got to, if, if you look at your, your actuarial assumptions, you got to hit somewhere north of 5% in income in order to pay the bills, right? So, and that's with 90% fixed income. If you look at where um, yields are, right? I'm sure you're looking at it every day. We're at 140 on the 10 year. Where if you look at the global high yield bond index, you're at 420. Okay. You're not hitting 5%. That means you either have to go down to triple C and buy some, buy yourself some Evergrande to get the yield that you need, or you got to figure something else out. And right now they're trying to figure that thing out. It's not fixed income. So I mean, yeah, this is painful so, for me, right? Because I, most of my career, I manage fixed income and, and, and I'm, and I'm saying right now, the 60, 40, 70, 30 models have to just be completely blown up, right? Because yeah, it's not sure. getting you anywhere. For sure. Especially when you are Yeah, I mean, yeah. we're actually in conversations with insurance companies and have had these about building indices to help with this problem because for what you're just saying. But right. um, so is if Bitcoin and they're paid a dividend, if those types of assets ever paid a dividend, well, hey, would they? And would they pay it in Bitcoin? Well, they, they do. Um, but not Bitcoin. I mean, Bit, Bit, Bitcoin's more of just kind of a, a broad concern, you know, currency that you can I mean, you can lend it out and, and, and make money off of it. But the way that Bitcoin works, the way that its network works is you have people that have set up um, uh, CPUs that are constantly calculating all the all the transactions that happen on the on the on the, on the Bitcoin network. And that's called proof of work. It's, it's, it's what we call the, the computational network that does all of that. And the people that do that get rewarded in, in a little bit of Bitcoin that comes to them uh, for all of those transactions. Another set, most, and, and these are mostly the protocol uh, currencies that I was talking about earlier, utilize a system called proof of stake. And this is much smaller computational networks um, it's less secure because of it, but it's still pretty secure. And the way that it works is you run a thing called a master node for the mo most of them, you run a master node and those master nodes are doing the computations. And the way that the master node gets chosen is you take a piece of your, of your, of your stash of those tokens and vote and stake it to whichever master node that you want it, that, that, that you want to run the network. Those master nodes earn rewards, they get a little piece of it, and then they pay it to you to, to run that staking system. So for, for, for most of the protocol tokens that we manage in our trust, including the, 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 the protocol mm -hmm. trust I talked about, we're running master nodes and we're running staking services and paying out a yield to our clients um, uh, in those particular currencies. And those That's yields the run man. I don't, I've never... Uh, I thought I just came up with that genius idea. So y'all been doing it. That's not been marketed that I know of anywhere that you can receive somewhat that's analogous to a dividend. That's kind of cool. Yeah, um, yeah. By the way, most of most of our early investors are, are former bond guys like me. They're like, oh, I can get a, I can get a yield. <laughs> so I think I think that's really important. I mean, I, I, from my perspective, that's that's important. But anyway, Leah, man, I'm sorry for taking up all y'all's time. I'll shut up. I'm sure you got questions or whatever. Beyond that. that. That was a real pleasure, actually. Thank you, Chad. I was able to sit back, listen to both of you. I've got some history lessons as well in there, Stephen. You know, that was that was fantastic, Chad. And I, I just want to say that, you know, I think you are asking the questions that most people are scared to ask, uh, especially other large asset managers. So I think you asked all the right questions. Um, but now I get to have a little fun since the audience did, you know, send in some questions. But Chad, I just want to start with you to follow up because, you know, we definitely heard Stephen's take on portfolio allocation, but you're a genius money manager as well. <laughs> so if you could talk just from your own thoughts, your own strategies, 
um, on how you do portfolio allocation and think through uh, allocating to you know, a, a volatile asset class like Bitcoin, which it is, you know, how are you thinking about it? Yeah, I mean, that's that's the whole issue. And that's why I was excited to get, I mean, I'd love to just wear him out because I, I, I do <laughs> want to solve for this. But, you know, what we do is, you know, it, it's active risk-based management. It's probably the most top-down strategy uh, that you can imagine. So we're really investing in, in the five major traditional asset classes. Uh, all of our portfolios are def defined by a numerical drawdown number. So really what we do is, is, is incredibly simple. We, we identify the macro business cycle where we are, and we look at yield curve, you know, interest rates as an indication of mon you know, monetary supply, which translates to earnings, which translates to price. We aggregate this data, do some engineering, and um, figure out where we are in the cycle, and we allocate to those asset classes, literally the, you know, the broad asset classes that perform relatively well in that point in the cycle. And then we hedge, uh, with inverse or non-correlated asset classes, again, using the broad asset classes. So really simple, uh, and the, the amount of the hedge built in is due to, to the drawdown number of the portfolio. If you're in our seven, it's designed to drop up to 7% from top to bottom. If you're our 10, 10. And so um, that's why this becomes really, really important to me, because I've got people wanting to be involved in this space, but I've got to figure out how to, where it fits in. Is it like a currency? Is it like a bond? Is it like real estate? You know, I believe real estate today is a is an asset class. You know, and, and it's publicly available. And, and you know, we invest in you know the large REIT. So um, I've got to solve for this. The volatility scares me to death. I mean, and can I get out? You know, where is it? What I would like to do with this, to be straight up with you is all of our models have a 2% hedge position in cash. You know, it's literally in a money market account. It's doing nothing, right? And so, but it's highly liquid. It solves for fees and some other things. Um, I would love to figure out how to sleeve, you know, Bitcoin into that, right? Um, and so, but again, I've got to put 100 million in it or 200 million at once. And that's a scary, scary proposition for me at this point, what I see in this industry. Um, and that's why I'm really interested to see where where is it going to fit? How soon is it going to going to be here for people like me who need it in a scaled way and in a safe, transparent way with tight spreads? And I can get out man, and take care of my people. Um, and I'm really looking forward to that. I think it's coming, man. I can feel it because I can feel the demand. You know, the public wants this desperately. Their advisors you know, have pressure on them to get it in place. They put the pressure on me. And so now I've got the pressure on y'all <laughs> to, to let's get this solved because um, it needs to get solved. And I, I do I do think it's the future. And you're, you're hearing that from somebody who I really am completely ag agnostic. Obviously, I know nothing about it. Don't care. It actually is confusing. I, frankly, I wish it had never happened. My life would be easier. But it is it has happened and we need to get in front of it and, and, and deal with it. So, yeah. I mean, look, if, if it were, if it were me, you know, like I, I, I would, I, I think people need to completely blow up their old models. Right. I think, I think models today have to be built for the expectation of inflation and inflation isn't going to be transitory. This is, I, I, I think, I think we're going to see higher and higher prints on CPI and this isn't going away anytime soon. Uh, all the money printing we've done over the last 12 years is finally catching up. It's a lot of helicopter money. And we're, we're just, inflation is just going to keep getting worse. And it's, and we're, and, and, and our response as a, as a country is just keep printing more money and passing more spending bills to battle inflation, right? That's, you know, it's kind of an interesting approach. Um, so uh, I think models have to now be built with inflation in mind. And do you, do you put bonds that yield nothing or, 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 you know, really risky bonds that yield over 4% when CPI is at 6.8? No, you can't do that. You're losing money. So, so, so what are, what are the things that are, that are built for inflation, right? I mean, I would do something like 50% equities, 20% real estate and, when I, and real estate, including farmland, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's where the biggest opportunity is in, in real estate. 20% hard assets, private equity, other alternatives, traditional alternatives, and then 10% in Bitcoin and crypto assets. To me, that's a that's a that's actually a conservative portfolio. My portfolio is way crazier than that. Yeah. 
And Stephen, just a follow up to what Chad said, since you are our CIO, we have Bitcoin on our balance sheet. You know, why is it that you're able to sleep at night, not as concerned about the volatility with our own balance sheet? And sorry to add a, another complexity to it. You know, when looking at the Bitcoin futures ETFs, can we simply just think about orders and limits in the same way that we think of, you know, trading or position sizing with other ETFs, how, how, do, how do you sleep at night, Stephen? Is it, is it simple or not? Well, it's, it's simple for me because I guess I've been around long enough to where the volatility we're seeing in Bitcoin right now is nothing compared to what we had before. Um, but also, um, I, I have a high level of confidence in the, uh, in the inflation theme and Bitcoin's in anti-inflationary stance. So, you know, you have to manage your your balance sheet as a, as a company or as even as an individual um, from the perspective of knowing, you know, when your liabilities are hitting. So, so you definitely have to hold a little bit of cash for short-term liabilities. And, and, then, and then you manage it out from there. So the longer end of the tail of liabilities is where you can put Bitcoin. And, you know, when can I go to Walgreens and buy you know, a, a six pack of Miller Lite or whatever in a, um, and I probably wouldn't go to Walgreens for that, but they do sell it. Well, when, when can I go there and just use Bitcoin to buy it? Well, since you're a fan of Walmart, I, I'm pretty sure that in the next six months, you're going to be able to buy it at Walmart. Okay. You, you can already buy anything in the country of El Salvador using Bitcoin through your phone. Yeah. But who, who wants to buy anything from El Salvador? Or go, you know. I, I get it. Is, I get it. The point is, that, you can do it in a third world country. You can do it pretty quick here. Yeah, but they it's were already they, happening here. There's there's certain places you can go and buy things in Bitcoin today. That's what I want to know. So you think you think we're a year away from Bitcoin being a, 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 I can be used anywhere in the U.S. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Well, not anywhere, but many places, many more places. Yeah, yeah. and that to me that might be the most important. I mean, that might be the that's the watershed moment when it yeah. just becomes as simple as, you know, when you get a Burger King and you pay with Bitcoin. As soon yeah. as that happens, I think it's game over um, because that's when you, you do have institutional adoption. And that's the fancy word I would use for it. Yeah. So you think a year? I think so. I think, I think you're, you're going to be able to buy in a lot more places in a year. Um, the, the other thing that we're fighting too is, you know, where we are in the adoption curve. Uh, Bitcoin's moving. It, it's still a speculative asset but it's moving from speculative asset to anti-inflationary asset. And soon after that, it'll be a lot easier to use because the short-term volatility is slowly going to get lower and lower as we get more and more adoption. Yeah, sure. Well, that's a good note. I will say I actually tipped my barista this morning in Bitcoin. So that you was did? Okay. All right. I did. All right. Perhaps I forced it on that coffee shop though, you know, so that's uh, maybe, you know, a little, a little bit of a bias there, but um, so a a anyways, Chad, happy to leave it to you for any final questions with Steven, Steven, vice versa to Chad. Otherwise, thank you both for this spectacular hour. No, man, I appreciate it. And, um, you know, obviously I love getting to work with you guys. I'm going to, I'm really interested to see what our engineers come back with and I'm, I'll be talking to you guys soon, I imagine. So thanks for having me. Thank it's, you. A, it's a real pleasure. Chad, thank you again so much. Steven, thank you so much, everybody for listening. Thank you for joining us today. Um, if you have any questions about CE credit, please feel free to email us. We're happy to help. And generally speaking, we're happy to answer any questions you have and, and be a, a friendly face in the ecosystem while you start navigating this wild west of crypto. So thank you everybody today. Take care. See you.